everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Variety.com and Billboard.com and Access.com, welcoming you to another session of Things We Said Today, our weekly talk fest about anything and everything Beatles. Let me introduce my two co-hosts from the other side of the world. Well, the East Coast, anyway. From the great and glorious state of Maine, where he gets lobster for almost for nothing. Um, <laughs> the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. The one and only Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And from the great state of Connecticut, where Red Sox fans abound, I think. Um, there are many. There are many. There are many. There are many. Ooh, okay. Boo his. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. The host of uh, The Beatles Show, uh, Every Little Thing, uh, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And if it's true that uh, that Alan gets lobsters for free, I'm going to be spending a week in his house. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of don't think they're about. free. <laughs> Okay. I have, I, 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 for the record, I have not bought any lobsters since I've been here because I don't eat what? them. <laughs> what? Really? Well, you know how on The oh Sopranos my. they say uh, our non-shellfish eating friends? That's me. Right? <laughs> oh. You say it like, uh, like, uh, like he does. Um, anyway, we have a special guest this week, um, Mr. Ken Womack, the author uh, of uh, Maximum Volume, The Life of... Beatles producer, the early years, number uh, 1926 to 66. I can't even read that straight. Hello, Ken. Hey, how are you doing, Steve? Good to see everybody. Hear everybody. <laughs> it's going to be interesting keeping the two Kens separate, but we'll figure out a way. Um, before we get started, we're going to just go, go into a couple of news things. Um, the first thing is the, um, the news of the unreleased George Harrison track being au- auctioned by Omega Auctions called Song to Miss Molly B. According to the auction house, the song dates from 1968 from around the time of uh, Wonderwall. Um, I have not heard the um, clip on the online yet. Uh, I understand there is one there. But I understand that someone has posted online that uh, the song is actually not George Harrison after all, but it's Donovan. And and I, I, I have to say that when these things come out from auction houses, I tend to be very skeptical about the details. And the fact that nobody has heard of this song kind of put a question mark in my brain. But, it, I mean, obviously it's very possible. But And if it is a, a real George Harrison song, then, you know, God, this is, uh, you know, big news, obviously. But um, I'm just going to throw it around the table. And, and, Ms., and Ken Womack, you're welcome to join in on this. Uh, first, I'm going to go to Ken Michaels. Ken, what do you think? Well, I haven't heard the excerpt that's online, but um, judging by the source that that uh, you got this information from, he's extremely knowledgeable, and I trust his judgment. But there, you never know what's out there that's unreleased, especially when you're considering reel-to-reel tapes. I mean, the Beatles no, could have made, you know, the, the, it, we have no idea how much is out there that is unreleased still, that's privately owned from any of the, the four Beatles or... Oh. John and George's estates, but I'm just saying that, you know, there could be still recordings that we don't even know about, but right. based on the source that, that you uh, got this information from, I trust his judgment a lot, and you can certainly tell the difference between Donovan and George in their voices, right. so. Uh, Omega has come up with some good auctions in the past, but I am very skeptical. I've found numerous factual errors in, in auction offerings before. So you have to really kind of be careful with these things. Um, you know, again, they they tend to there there have been ones that have been pulled because they're totally you know wrong. But I'm relatively skeptical, especially on something like this that nobody has heard before. And given the documentation that of Beatles stuff, you know, that is out there, um, it's hard to. Well, I, I I am hesitant. I hope it is. But, you know, I don't know. Alan, what, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, my feelings are sort of similar. Um, with auction houses, it can often be a little dicey unless, I mean, I'm just going to sound pretty elitist, but unless it's um, Sotheby's or Christie's. But Sotheby's and Christie's, 
in London at least, um, bring Mark Lewison in to listen mm-hmm. to or look at the materials that they're putting up for auction. And so they have, you know, they have a very reputable uh, um, advisor on that kind of thing. And I don't know about the other auction houses. So, um, right. you know, I guess it, it kind of depends on what their track record is and all. Um, in terms of, um, you know, us not having heard of it before, uh, that obviously is not really dispositive because things turn up that we've never heard before. I mean, there was a, a Harrison song called Sheltering in Your Love that no one knew anything about. Right. That just sort of turned up and uh, not just now, but like maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, but at the time, no one knew anything about it. And it was just, uh, it just turned up on a, a tape uh, that someone had in their collection um, for some mm. reason. So, uh, you know, it's always very possible that something will turn up. But if, um, you know, if you're, the source um, you've mentioned says Donovan, then there's a very good likelihood that it is. I, I haven't heard the excerpt that probably would be enough to say whether it was Donovan or not, right? Well, okay. I, th- I think the, the comment was that the melody matched Donovan. Mm-hmm. So well, was it George's I voice? I, that I, I had, like I said, I have not heard the, the clip online, uh, so I don't know. I mean, um, if it was but, George, if it was George singing a Donovan song, that would be also noteworthy, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure. But uh, right, right. Ken, Ken Womack, do you have any com- any comments? Yeah, I do. Uh, what I I enjoy these these uh, scenarios when they emerge. They are very much like studying a lost painting, right, and trying to establish provenance and and uh, you know, in authenticity. I. I um, I would. I think the the jury's out until we hear it, and until um, others have stepped in to authenticate. Uh, I find these these moments very interesting for that reason. But uh, you know, like I said, the jury's out until we have a chance to examine it. But but if it's true, what a find! Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Anyway, let's not forget, by the way, the song that Olivia Harrison played on um, Jules yeah Holland? Jules Holland on his show. That was uh, a cover of a Charlie Dorr song, and she played a minute of it, and we never knew anything about it. Mm-hmm. So it, there's no telling how much exists right. that we don't know about. And, but, so. but again, it, you know, it depends on the source, too. I mean, in, in a case like that, you're not going to question it because it's Olivia Harrison. Sure. So anyway. And then the other big news of the week, uh, actually it will be next week, when Paul McCartney comes back to the U.S., Starting September 11th um, at Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, Ken, are you going to that? Ken Michaels? No, um, I'm not going to that one, but I'm going to see him at one of his shows at Madison Square Garden, then one of his shows at Barclays Center, and then one of his shows at Nassau Coliseum. So uh, we've seen plenty of Paul <laughs> in the next you're few gonna be, You're going to be paying, paying for Paul in your... Uh, in your sleep uh, for a long time, uh, Ken Womack, are you going? Are you going to see him uh, next week by chance? I'm not. Um, <laughs> my wife and I are going to see Depeche Mode. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> at, at, Interesting. Uh, a little blast from the the dark part of the dance floor, as the Rolling Stone described it some years really? ago. Yeah, uh, but uh, well, I my I've seen him uh, upwards of times at this point. I'd really like to see him in Canada or in the UK uh, at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, to to have a different kind of experience, and to see Mull of Kintyre, maybe. <laughs> there you go. That's right. I want yeah. those pipes. Bring on. Yeah. The so do I. So do I. So now we're we're uh, like I said uh, earlier, uh, we have a special guest, uh, and I will reintroduce him. Ken Womack, the author of Maximum Volume: The Life of Beatles producer George Martin. Martin the early years, nineteen twenty-six to sixty-six. Again, welcome, welcome aboard, Ken. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. It's great to be with you guys. Let me let me start with uh, I, I, I guess the 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 obvious question to start with is why did you go back to the pre Beatles years? Um, I went to the pre Beatles years to provide the long view of George Martin's life, right? To to be able to start uh, with his earliest moments, uh, his formative years, of course, but also uh, the years in which he experimented with different kinds of sounds different kind of recording techniques during his early Parlophone years, his pre-Beatles Parlophone years from 1950 to 1962. So really it was a need to to try to provide 
readers with the long view. Mm-hmm. What was it? What was one thing that you, one uh, major thing that you found in those early years that maybe that we didn't know about? My gosh, uh, I suppose one in general would be the depth of of the Martin family's poverty. I think it easily rivaled, if not surpassed, what uh, the the Starkey family experienced in the Dingle. Uh, they had no electricity, no running water. They had one gas jet. I suppose that the Martin family fought over next to the fireplace. Um, they really lived in in uh, significant poverty, and um, it did not approve, improve over the subsequent years. Uh, in fact, you know George's father, Harry, uh, was um, unemployed, and of course, starting with the Great D- Depression, and uh, they, they they just had brutal times, really. And um, in fact, things got to be so bad at one point that. Uh, They began to take in orphans uh, to receive the stipends from the government. So I I don't think we really had a sense of of how impoverished the Martin family really was. Wow, that's that's pretty. What got it? What what was the one thing that got him into music or what was there? Was there a one incident that got him into music? Well, there are a number. There are a number of different incidents. And George cites several. Uh, including um, the piano that they got from uh, a relative. Uh, his uncle worked in a piano factory, which gave them access to something that a family like that simply wouldn't have had in any capacity otherwise, and that was a piano, and he liked playing around on it. So there was certainly that. Uh, he has a romantic uh, version of being at the Bromley School and uh, Adrian Bolt coming down from London with the orchestra and playing Debussy and, uh, you know, George hearing the girl with the flaxen hair or something like that and, and just being blown away, blown away by the quality uh, of the music. So there was certainly that. I think when you fast forward, it was his way out and his way up uh, in terms of working with what he the man he called his his fairy godfather, Sidney Harrison, who seemed to turn up every time George needed a break. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it off around the room. Um, Alan, you you go ahead. Um, so, what was um, researching this um, like? What did did were there interviews? I, I've looked at the uh, bibliography, and you've got you know all of the the George Martin sources, which um, he's written a bunch of books and and uh, Mark Lewison and some of the other books too. Um, did you do interviewing for it and or uh, research into things that have not been you know seen in several decades, like you know newspaper interviews from way back? Um, all of those things are certainly true. Uh, one of the the real finds for me was uh, speaking with. George's eldest son, Gregory Paul Martin, Mm. who, via his mother, Sheena, had lots of memories of their early years together and uh, was able to provide some of the photos you can see in the the photo section that we've never seen before, uh, including my favorite, which is George Martin with a kind of devilish goatee. Um, (laughs) Yeah, goatee. And we were able to put photographs with some of... uh, the moments in George's life, such as um, when he was a member of a dramatic society, um, which also was very important during his formative years. But mm-hmm. I was able to get lots of information I simply didn't have about those early years and the level of poverty. Because when I'm sure, as all of you are, when you're familiar with George's three major autobiographical works, which in many ways is most of the material we have to go on, George tends to paint a kind of rosy picture, mm-hmm. even when things are not rosy. There's a great moment uh, with his youngest son, Giles, in uh, the documentary they did a few years ago, where George is talking about just an extreme moment of poverty, but he's doing it in such a way, I almost wanted to you know, enjoy it nostalgically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. of the, the beautiful tenor of his voice. And, uh, and so, working with folks like that, I was able to start to to get a a similar but different picture to provide some shades that maybe we didn't have before. Yeah. Yeah, he mm. actually hasn't in his uh in his books or interviews, he hasn't really talked much about his first marriage and his two older kids and and um I think you painted a very sympathetic picture of Sheena um about whom we know virtually nothing apart from her name. Um is she <laughs> is she alive still? 
she died in uh, in 2014, I believe. Uh, okay. When did you start right. working on this? Um, I started working on this um, in 2014. <laughs> Uh, so I, I missed any opportunity to work with her and to learn more about her, at least directly from her. Mm -hmm. But I've been working mm -hmm. on it since 2014. As you might imagine, when George died in March 2016, my publisher checked in, <laughs> yeah. you, know, to, you, know, you know how those deadlines go, to see how things were going. And right. Um, right. As, as you also know, one of the, the challenges of trying to tell a long story from a, a long well-lived life like George's is the fact that it takes so much uh, textual real estate to capture it. So, hence, uh, since you have volume one there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what, what else did you get from the uh, – did you also interview Alexis, the older daughter? I have not spoken to Alexis um, uh -huh. at this point. Um, I would like to, and uh, I'm, I'm still hoping for that opportunity. Yeah. So what, what else did um, Gregory provide? He provided uh, stories about um, the family and how they carried on. You know, Mark Lewison very usefully opened the door for us to understand in a deeper way the double life uh, that George Mark was leading. He was able to help me understand what that was like to be as a kid who lived out, um, uh, you know, in the suburbs uh, with the family. Mm -hmm. And... And, and how they were able to, to create that masquerade because anyone who knows uh, created or broken families, um, you know, knows that it takes more than one person to create that kind of illusion. And in this case, it was both George and Sheena, um, who Sheena, of course, not wanting George to ultimately leave and then divorce her and George trying to protect the space inside of his new life in the city. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, as opposed to her life out in suburban Hatfield, what they would do is they created a kind of illusion where dad would go off to work in the city and they would come in and see him on weekends. They would go to the cinema or they would go to the zoo. And, you know, for the kids, for Alexis and Gregory, it was just uh, it was just a great way to see their father who had this cool life uh, working in the recording industry. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was generally pre Beatles. Now, as Gregory would point out, his you know his older sister, who was older than him and also perhaps maybe a little more intuitive, started to realize what was going on long before he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you seem in the book to want to try and reconcile the story as we always knew it with the newer, you know, the version of how basically the Beatles were foisted upon him rather than his having seen something in them. And I, I think in the end, you finally sort of give up on that. And, and <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, as, as you know, as you're reading that section of it, it looks like, you, you know, you, you kind of want to find a way to weave the, the standard telling in. Um, because it's what we've, I guess, all have always believed until Tune In came out. Um, right. right. And, um, uh, that's a very, that's a great observation, and that was very intentional. I wanted there to be a tension between George's sort of Hollywood discovery version of events right. and what we right. know must be true because of the the contract, not an audition, because of the timing, because George had been found out. Uh, by Lynn Wood, because he'd also been found out uh, all, uh, similar to that by his wife, you know, back home. So I wanted to create a kind of tension there with the truth sort of uh, winning out in the end. So I'm, I'm glad you read it that way. Uh, you're the first I've talked to who gets that. Mm -hmm. um, it also, uh, I, I find it interesting, you know, going back for a moment to what we, t we talked about with George's double life and the way he was living his life. He's living his life in compartments, and uh, that makes a lot of sense when you think about him. And I tried not to become an amateur psychologist. But when you think about a person who has self-consciously refashioned their accent, who has allowed others to sort of lead them along, like Sidney Harrison, mm -hmm. who has different lives that he's leading in different places, multiple, really. He has the life with Judy. He has the life with Sheen and his family. He has the life with the Beatles, eventually. That's a very protected space for him, right? Because at a certain point, especially after he leaves EMI, he has got to protect that space because 
It has become his livelihood. So he's living his life in these kind of compartments. And I, I think he had his own struggle. Well, he had to have had his own struggle with that, too. And I, I, I hope that comes out as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, another another place where there's um, some tension between the traditional telling and what probably really happened was was the whole, uh, you know, when he begins to record them, I mean, having been assigned them and then not wanting to bother going to the first session and leaving it with Ron Richards. And you sort of show him going back and forth between, you know, being the professional George Martin who would take this under, you know, his wing and do it. And rebelling against the fact that he's been assigned it, you know, that's at least how I read that part. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, he's stuck knowing he has to record these. What are they? Six sides. He's got to do six sides with these guys. And there is a lot of tension there uh, for him. Uh, and, of course, it really comes to a head when he finds himself between Mitch Murray and <laughs> and. <laughs> Stein and, of course, EMI, he's suddenly really at sea and is ready to throw up his arms. But, you know, he's getting paid. And let's face it, one of the most important things about him during that point is he needed the money. This He wasn't Nori Paramore. He was a guy with a family, a girlfriend, and his, you know, his 3,000 pounds wasn't going very far. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, Ken? The other Ken? <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> This is just uh, amazing, these observations here. I want to go back to the very beginning of your book. In fact, it's on page one. Um, You said that George Martin, you called him a child prodigy. You didn't really explain why you thought of him that way. I know that you very early on mentioned all of his interests, and he had loads of interests as a young child. But why did you refer to him that way? What made him a child prodigy? Well, he had written most of the Spider's Dance, right? Is that the name of his first composition? Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm flubbing it, but he'd written most of it in his early years. And it's a, uh, a brilliant little piece of writing. With, If anything, he's a, uh, a child prodigy mimic, perhaps, would have been the better way to put it, because he has mimicked the sound of, 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 uh, of rag music, of, uh, of parlor music just exquisitely in that song. If we're to believe that he wrote it when he wrote it, and I, you know, I, I've, I've dug profusely to try to, to try to play with that notion, but I refer to him in that way. And you're right, he has interests uh, that are legion, or he tells us that he has interests that are legion throughout his works. And I say that because uh, in many cases, it's very difficult to verify some of his stories Um, Although I was able to find in a number of cases where his timeline was off and he was maybe telling us things that happened later or things that happened earlier. And uh, it it took some doing. In fact, a number of times I found myself chasing down rabbit holes that weren't real, only to have to reel them back in and and rewrite huge swaths of the book. Mm -hmm. But I I do feel like in the sense that he his self-directedness to me is very interesting, the way he does pursue those interests, because he's. Other than his father's sort of artistic carpentry side, he does seem to be a natural, at least in terms of ingenuity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, you bring up his piano playing, which he was doing early on. How good a piano player was he? Because throughout his youth, you know, he, he played in various groups. I think, it, was it in the army he was also playing? He was definitely uh, playing the army, and, and two things that we have that are strong verification for having a lot of skills um, would be one: he got all, he and the the fortune uh, fortune tellers, the fortune tellers, the fortune tellers uh, were able to get a lot of gigs around town in a time when live music was very important to having dance halls in operation. So he was able to do that, and throughout his time. In the fleet air arm at various moments in training, he was able to attract the attention of better musicians who were impressed by him. And of course, as Mark Lewison uh, was able to verify, we know he was also eventually on essentially the Armed Forces Radio. So George was able to consistently attract attention for his skill. Sheena noticed it too uh, when he played with the, the choir. 
uh, when he, you know, was in his final days before demobbing himself in, in Scotland. So mm-hmm. we, we have a lot of evidence that, that he was up to scratch, but he was still a scratch piano player. And that's why he needed Sidney Harrison to help him learn uh, notation. And he was also nervous performing in front of people, right? Allegedly, right? Um, <laughs> but then <laughs> that's what it says in your book here. So right, right. Well, and and I, I again, I'm trying to to deal with the tension uh, between what George is telling us and what may be the truth. He claimed to have a lifelong sense of nerves, but then he was able to conquer it enough to go on. He he would foist himself on stage, as you see with the quavers in the book. He was able to play with that that dance hall band and even be the lead guy uh, by a certain point. So there's a tension between, again, these compartmentalized selves uh, that George Martin has and and the reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, th- the reason I bring this up is because if you listen to the piano solos that he did in the Beatles, most of them are short, as the, you know, that's how it was. It fit the song perfectly. And many of them, most of them, I would say, were fairly simple to play. And then if you take a song like In My Life, where the solo is just such an important, uh, an important part of the song, he said that he had trouble playing it at that speed. So he had to play it at a slower speed with the tape running slower, and then he sped it up. So, I mean, even for something like that, that seemed to be difficult for him to play. Right. And this is where his testimony becomes very interesting, right? Because you recall what he said about the oboe, too, about mm-hmm. how terrible was it was like an eel in his hands mm-hmm. and uh, he was able to busk pretty effectively playing the oboe uh it's a tangle when you when you're dealing with george's words but the results often speak for themselves so he's able to accommodate his playing on in my life you're right he plays some fairly simple pieces in those early beatles songs but they sure are tight and uh as you know many of those were captured in very few, often a single take. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. Do we have any recordings? I know we all know of the music that, that he wrote for Yellow Submarine, but of his own compositions early on, you mentioned one called Prelude. I yes. mean, any of these early compositions, or even throughout the 50s, are there, I'm not talking about the, the songs that he produced for other artists on, on Parlophone, I mean, his own compositions. Do we have any of that recordings that you know we can listen to now that we know exist? We have the pieces that he, like the Spider's Dance, of course, that are on uh, on the the great multi volume work that that Lewison uh, created some years ago. We have the well, no, those would be on produced by George Martin, rather. Um, mm-hmm. but, but we have the sheet music, which I've had access to, and and uh, and a number of his compositions. So. He, uh, that he did while he was at the Guild Hall when he became quite proficient uh, at orchestration. And he wrote a number of original pieces, presumably as, um, as assignments at the Guild Hall School of Music, where he would take, for example, the poetry of Yeats and set it to music. Right. Um, but beyond that, we really have uh, almost nothing that survives. And it makes sense because, of course, back in the 50s, you didn't. You didn't really, at least at EMI Studios, you didn't come in and screw around. You had a 90-minute session, and that was it. And whatever wasn't used was recorded over. So, um, you know, George almost needed, uh, as we say in higher education, a business purpose probably for doing anything. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because I sure would love to hear what any of these early compositions sounded like. You know, there's there's a song that I've played on my radio show from time to time which is written by George Martin, that Mary Hopkin recorded called The Game. Yes. Which is a beautiful piece of music, and it's perfect for the theater or for show music. So you know the talent is there. You know that he's quite capable of writing this material. I would love to have heard more more songs like that. Yeah, it's interesting how he uses his, his – he does, of course, have enormous opportunities – in the 1960s, uh, particularly 65, 66, 67, to record uh, with his United Artists contract that he earns and is renewed once before it's actually by um, by agreement from both parties uh, deleted uh, around 1970. He does have this enormous opportunity 
to carry out his own recordings, but what does he do with it? He records Montavani-esque uh, instrumentals of pop hits of the day. Mm-hmm. And um, other than other than he was trying to fulfill those contracts, I see no... I've been able to glean no reason for why he didn't do things, do, didn't carry out more original activities. It may have been just sheer lack of time. Um, when you look at those years, he was extraordinarily busy every moment of the day, and when he finally has a moment when he might have earned some peace, he goes and starts a new company, which means he's now um, having to find his way as a businessman, too. But for whatever reason in his life, he makes a choice moving away uh, from that kind of original composition. Okay. Can that okay. remind, if I can interrupt, that kind of reminds me of something I saw a few years ago, and I'm sorry I didn't buy it. I was in a record store, and I saw a recording of George uh, conducting uh, a solo show in South America where he had done a whole lot of, not only Beatles stuff, but I think it was other stuff too. And I'm sorry, I did, I, I did not buy it, and I could kick myself to, to you know, today, because it, it was obviously a bootleg. But didn't he, but didn't he uh, go on tour and do shows the uh, solo shows, you, you know about those? Sure, he had a couple of tours he carried out um, with different themes. One of them was the one you're describing, where he would um, play with local symphony orchestras, and, and they would do a kind of musical review. I have some of those programs that would be similar to that, and uh, as he would have told you, he had great fun doing them. And then um, he also, uh, of course, did a later lecture tour, um, right. work went mm-hmm. to places like you know Chicago or even our own nearby Red Bank, uh, <laughs> you know just a few miles from where I am now. So he had a, a a very good time doing that and talking about the Beatles. Now, of course, in the latter example, he spent a lot of time talking about the kind of officialized story uh, of discovery, and you know that that's obviously unraveling very quickly uh, over the last several years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let me, uh, uh, Ken Womack, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, did you, I mean, the the timeline for your research kind of uh, uh, hits the, just uh, uh, near the uh, publication of, of, the Mar- of the Lewison book. Did you get any reaction from the Martins about the, about the uh, revelations in, in Lewison, about George? Um, I've had... Uh, no reaction whatsoever. Um, my understanding is um, just that not everyone uh, is necessarily happy uh, about this story, but, you know, they've sort of been company people, right? Uh, okay. That's an official line. We've seen this kind of rejection from the folks in, in that inner circle before, not just among, among the Martins, but of course, among everyone. This is a story that has existed for a long time. Of course, uh, I think if he were here, Mark would probably tell you that the other story had always existed, too. It just hadn't been peeled back. I mean, it was clear that right. George married his, his secretary in 1966 uh, and that he had a previous marriage. The only thing surprising is that people may not may, hadn't spent more time about it, uh, revealing it sooner. I find that interesting. I'm not sure why. I, I think maybe it's because we want to... Um, we, we desire these kind of showbiz discovery stories, right? Um, but I think this story is more interesting. It makes George a round character who is more like us, right? Who, you know, did not come by that, that cut glass voice naturally, who affected his own future, um, who struggled with his relationship with his mother there right before her untimely death, who amazingly tried to scuttle the band that made his name and yet has a, a moment of, of total redemption when he realizes that they've listened to him with his instructions for Please Please Me, and that changes the course of his life. He discovers his life work. I think that story is better, but I imagine that many in the, the Beatles' inner circle maybe are not as fond of it when they've been using the other one for so long. Mm-hmm. Was the, uh, the I'm thinking about the, uh, the whole uh, How Do You Do It episode – and how things evolved and how, you know, later on uh, the Beatles became, you know, so big and everything. Were there, I mean, in the beginning he, you know, he control, he basically controlled them and in later years they basically called the shots. How did he take that? 
Was that, well, did he accept that very easily? You bet he did. I think he took it well because, again, you get to late 1965 when he's gone, gone out on his own. He needs them to be in his stable, and he is willing to maneuver in any way necessary to keep them there. They are heirs' meal ticket, even though they're getting them at a very reduced rate because of the deal he signed uh, with EMI, his exit agreement. But in any event, you know, he needs them. So uh, it's important for him to have what he called his tactical withdrawals. He knew how to move forward and pull back at times uh, so that he could keep them where he needed to be. Now, of course, setting that sort of um, <laughs> maybe overly self-conscious attitude about things aside for a second, he was also driven passionately about where they were going. And there are times when, especially when you get to the White Album and he starts to raise his voice uh, in the summer of 1968, there are times when he seems almost to care more about the Enterprise than they do. So um, he's heavily invested in it both from a business sense, but also emotionally. And he feels responsible for them too. I think that's very genuine, the way he describes them, the way he describes his concern for them on the road. He had, uh, you know, his testimony is pretty clear in the testimony of others. He had no problem when they, they left the road. Of course, he also had the business interest. He would suddenly have more access to them. He wasn't ruled by Epstein's timetable anymore. But at the same time, I, I think we should believe him when he said how worried he was about their vulnerability from a sniper uh, <laughs> on the road and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alan? Uh, you know, one thing that we we touched on briefly and never uh, and, and then went elsewhere. Um, back to the way he got them at EMI. Um, I really think that Ardmore and Beachwood got a bad deal there, and um, <laughs> I, th- I think you 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 suggest that it might be because of whatever was going on between Sid Coleman and George Martin. Um, you have any idea what that was about? Or, or I do subsequently, and I don't like to. I, I do not take credit for others' research. Our, our colleague Mark Lewison has suggested that Sid had issues with George, and particularly the voice. You know, his his sort of his upper class masquerade. Undoubtedly, people saw through that. And of course, George Martin was not the only person doing that. Right? This is uh, it's the stuff of plays and great literature. Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, the kind of class uh, mobility or the self-directed class mobility. So hmm. he's not the first, but there there was certainly some tension there. I think the guy who gets burned is um, Kim. is Kim Bennett. And, and I, I did have occasion to spend a few moments with uh, Mark this summer and ask him some more about that. It's amazing that we even have access to that story. Mm-hmm. Uh, he managed to meet Kim uh briefly at a key moment before his own untimely passing yeah. and Bennett really gets screwed. You know, he, um, I'm sorry, he really gets, uh, <laughs> taken. I know this is a family program. Um, <laughs> in any event, we've, uh, we've said worse. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I was mostly kidding. He really does. I mean, Kim Bennett plugged love me do and worked hard. And as you said, Alan, I mean, our, Ard- our Beachwood had really set themselves up to, to do the job for the Beatles, and then what does George do? And it was nasty. He freezes them out. You know, he begins doing what George does. He create boxes around things. He would create a box around his family out in Hatfield. He created a box around the Beatles, and that's why he goes to Dick James and goes away from the company's own publisher. Think about that. Mm-hmm. Um his loyalty is really not to others, and that makes sense in the psychology of a guy who is trying to put his past behind him and only look forward to what he can get out of the future. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, one thing I don't totally understand is the whole business of – I mean, I understand that the Beatles felt – eventually that Dick James was sort of taking them for a ride. But the way I understood the setup of Northern Songs actually gave the... I always thought that it actually gave the Beatles greater participation than they would have had if they just signed to a publisher because they were getting part of the publishing royalties beyond, I think, what they would have gotten. But... In the book, you kind of say, suggest that 
it wasn't a good deal. So I, I, I hadn't quite been able to work out why it wasn't a good deal for them. It was a, it was a good deal in the sense, um, I mean, what, what, what you're saying I think is true, that they had access to pots of money uh, that they would not have had earlier than likely they would have had them. Does that make sense? Yeah. With the Dick James deal. Mm -hmm. What they didn't have was any control of their destiny. And that's what they bristle about later. Now, of course, they did have a shot, as we all know, at a moment when they were cash poor to do something about that and failed during that that Apple moment. Right. Um, Right. And then, of course, the later failure. And, of course, whole books have been written about this. So I, I, I yeah. think what they're going to – and, of course, I'm also foreshadowing there because that's going to be a discussion at length in Volume 2 right. uh, about what has been set up here and about, about Dick James's attitude. Of course, Dick is going to have several changes of heart in Volume 2. Spoiler alert, everybody, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you know, that will come into play. Uh, George has his own vexed relationship uh, with Dick James, although, as you noted, I'm sure – I'm always fascinated by the way George makes a point, and perhaps this is because of the Nori Paramore uh, situation and his relation with with Cliff Richard. George always makes a point of of showing how he didn't benefit from the Beatles publishing, even though it allegedly had been offered to him. So I've always um, also been a little puzzled about, I mean, I've, I've, I've always kind of admired what George Martin has said about not wanting to sort of, you know, have his name on a song that he had nothing to do with, that kind of thing, you know, like in the, the Nori Paramore case. And there was a lot of that in American um, song promotion and as well, you know, uh, uh, it was part of the payola thing. Um, but I'm not sure why it was a conflict, would have been a conflict of interest for him to have, say, a percentage of Northern songs, because it seems to me that it was really more a confluence of interest because of his job with EMI, because in either case, he has everything to gain and EMI has everything to gain by making their recordings a success. So I'm not sure what the conflict of interest was, really. I thought maybe you could well, explain that. I will do my best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, well, and, and these are splendid questions, and I like the conflict versus confluence. I think it's well said. But it, you know, part of that, George is imputing to Lynn Wood, right, L.G. Wood, mm-hmm. who was the managing director, and his feeling about not providing residuals. Right. Um, and seeing it that way. But like you said, that does not square. But there are a lot of um, – and, and this is a uh, – the more we, we refine our Beatles scholarship, and I'm sure you've encountered this before on the show, I find that so many of these details do not square. So what I try to do, as I said earlier, is is paint the tensions and let the reader think about them because we have such a huge – albeit limited, and I mean that paradoxically, recorded testimony on the state of affairs during those short years. Mm -hmm. And we get to these points where the official story, we're trying to square that with reality. And uh, of course, it so often doesn't work. I keep coming back in my head to the great Thornton Wilder quote uh, (laughs) that I I find when we follow up on these, these rabbit holes, and they're useful rabbit holes, so don't misread me. And the quote is, these are mysteries, give them no names. I think our best role is to try to expose them. Because what I find interesting in George's compartmentalized, wordy story where he has put out, frankly, he has published a lot of testimony that doesn't square. I think it's important for us to to walk up to the line and show those kind of flashpoints Mm -hmm. (laughs) of meaning and sometimes unmeaning. So... That, that is a great question, and it doesn't make sense, and uh, it particularly doesn't make sense if you elevate from George for a moment to L.G. Wood sort of blanching at the idea of having any kind of uh, interest in residuals, even to the point when they get to uh, – when they make the exit agreement for, um, for George's air company, which is Associated Independent Recordings, even to that point – greatly reducing uh, Ayer's royalty on Beatles records under the argument that, of course, EMI discovered them. Um, and, uh, and, and, of course, that – and, um, again, spoiler alert, folks, that also impacts George's royalties from Live and Let Die. 
Right. When he works on that project, he receives a reduced royalty. So, um, and and uh, presumably, I guess, Sentimental Journey, the Ringo Starr album, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I don't think it squares at all. Yeah. And somebody's not telling the truth. I think George is telling the truth there. I don't understand why that was the company line from LG Wood. Well, I, I think that was, they were just being parsimonious. I think they just didn't want to pay <laughs> him, you know, a, a, a royalty when they could have the royalties for the company, you know, themselves. Um, I just think they just didn't want to pay it. I didn't think they thought it was a conflict of interest. Um, they just were being skinflints. <laughs> Well, um, certainly, and that's true when George <laughs> signs that deal and and they, they figure out what could be his new annual salary by deducting all of the budget uh, of behind the Beatles recordings first. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. As though George is supposed yeah. to, you know, accrue all of those those debts. Right. Hmm. Oh, so gosh. where are you on volume two? And when is that I, new out? Well, I'm. I'm finding volume two to be even more challenging than volume one. And I think it has a lot to do with the very issues we're talking about here, trying to establish as much authenticity as possible in a world where there's a lot of haze. And unfortunately, (laughs) frankly, the, I think probably the person, and we may have missed this opportunity already who could tell us the most about, particularly the mid-period Beatles, maybe the early Beatles, was George's greatest cheerleader, and that's uh, she of the double-barreled name, right? Judy Lockhart Smith, mm-hmm. um, who has been mostly silent mm-hmm. uh, on a world that I think we can safely say she helped to build uh, and certainly egged George on to being tougher when he needed to be, certainly during the the moments when air was coming to being. So I'm working on those middle years right now, and I'm trying to establish some authenticity, and it's been pretty tough going, Mm -hmm. uh, quite frankly, uh, to square some of these stories. And, of course, once you get into that period, you also – and maybe you guys are getting TMI right now. I don't know. But uh, (laughs) but when you get into that (laughs) thing – Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, there really isn't. My issue right now is trying to square, for example, Jeff Emmerich's – commentary about the innovations that they carried out uh, Revolver and beyond uh, with George taking credit for some of those too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I also thought I also thought you you set up the potential um, uh, contrast which I think won't really come out until book two with uh, you're talking about Norman Smith and how he used to set up the mics and how he used to have them a bit distant so that it would get some of the room sound whereas <laughs> jeff's big innovation is always and then i came up with the idea of putting the mics really close yes <laughs> yeah. and i do try to net once i realized i had a, a multi-volume work i tried to do a lot of foreshadowing by dropping in certain names that will easter egg like <laughs> crack open in volume two um <laughs> right i mean you, you know uh, I think a a good story is like that, where some of the things that maybe we're experiencing in volume one will have a different sheen and a different light in in volume two. And that's a good example, that kind of contrast. You know, that's another great point there, by the way. You know, you brought up the microphone distance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We we read and hear so much about the white coated, uh, the the white coated lab like, you know, studio personnel. Uh, who seem to have, you know, little earpieces looking around for problematic behaviors around the studio. You know, you've put that mic too close, people being called under the carpet. I have different testimony on that from some people. You know, you'll you'll hear from some people that, sure, they were they were very deliberate in their guidelines about how a recording is made and no one should deviate from that. And then I've I've spoken to other people uh, during that heyday, who said, no, it was a lax place. Nobody got called onto the carpet. That was some reference guide from 1958, you know. So mm-hmm. I'm getting conflicting testimony on some of that. I think some of it, don't you guys find that when we, when we talk about this story, there is the experience of it. And again, this is something I was trying to do in the book, too, and still trying to do. There is the experience of the Beatles as they happen. And then there is this huge very sobering, and I'm borrowing this from Vladimir Dabakov, 
sobering backcast that everybody experiences, particularly anyone who's not a first generation fan. It's already happened, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go back to those moments in the mid 60s, Brian and George are still worried at times that they're going to be here today, gone tomorrow, that they're a flash in the pan. They consolidate certain levels of success with American Beatlemania. But, you know, 1966 is an incredible year where the competition elevates itself. And the Beatles obviously elevated their own game and bested them. But that was, uh, of course, um, an unknown future uh, as that year progressed. So I find it just as interesting to sort of go back into those moments and try to feel what it was like when everything wasn't so certain, when they hadn't made Abbey Road yet, when there was no Sgt. Pepper, mm-hmm. you know, there was no Strawberry Fields, when things were a little bit more tendentious. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you always heard about most artists then being a flash in the pan, and they always heard about that. So there must have been a lot of pressure at the time for them to, you know, keep being creative and staying on top of their game. So. Absolutely. And, you know, while there may be levels of dispute, and again, spoiler alert, this is part of volume two uh, between uh, among who came up with the various innovations for which we know so many of those recordings, right? You know, the Leslie experiments, the direct injection, etc. Um, mm-hmm. E.T., of course, Ken Townsend is back there, but was it George or Jeff who, who helped bring that into the booth and into the studio? But where I'm going with this is... <laughs> What we do know for sure is that when you listen to those mid-60s recordings, there is a level of fidelity that the Beatles recordings have that many of their contemporaries do not. And one of perhaps George's greatest contribution, bar anything else we're discussing, the validity of it or not of it, notwithstanding. Wow, that was a wordy sentence. What we do know is that George was a great curator for the Beatles, in terms of curating their sound and how it was released to the world. Mm-hmm. Ken, did okay. you have, Ken Michaels, did you have uh, another question? Yeah, a few more things. Uh, and, and in fact, we'll go back to something you just said about you know being innovative and who really was innovative. In your book, when George Martin is first working for Polyphone, we're going back to the early 50s here, and you bring up certain artists like Sidney Torch. Yes. Um, he, George Martin, was experimenting with multi-speed. And then you bring up uh, an interesting thing that he did with uh, Peter Ustinov for this piece called Mock Mozart. Which, you know, you look back at this now and you might not think it's a big deal, but probably for its time it was. Because Peter Ustinov sang three parts. He sang soprano, alto, and tenor. But what George Martin did, because they didn't have multi-track, was that Peter would sing one part, and then they would take that tape with the one part, he'd he'd sing above that, and that would go to another tape. You know, uh, what I want to know is, for that time, was that something entirely new, or was it just new for EMI? Or was this also going on, say, in America? Because you know that EMI was always behind the times. (laughs) Well, that's the allegation. Technology-wise. Yeah. (laughs) That's an allegation, or is that fact? Well, I mean, that, that, uh, that's a tough one. Um, I think w- w- if you listen to the studio personnel, uh, and of course the Beatles themselves, there is this, this belief that EMI Studios was, as you said, behind the times. You, you've probably read George Harrison's uh, lengthy commentary about how all they wanted was a new light Right. Yeah. <laughs> they just wanted a new light. George Martin just wanted the walls to be painted. Um, so there were these these constant complaints. And of course, we know about what happens when the Beatles finally force uh, EMI to allow them to go with eight track uh, in 1968. So there's a lot of truth to it. Um, but trying to sort out what is truth and what is mythology is uh, important. But going back to the question, which is such a such a great question, George is discovering that roughly contemporaneously with with folks in America making similar discoveries. You know, he does. But what's different uh, is George is making most of these discoveries by himself uh, in a kind of laboratory of his own making. So it's not that he's the first person to do it, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's 
but it is new for EMI, just as you had said. And if so, of course, what happens is when he takes some of these records, and Mock Mozart is a great example of this, to, this, to the EMI monthly meeting where they would talk about new releases, they thought, well, you're nuts. This is, this is not interesting. George thought it was really interesting. And I think it's the same George whom you guys alluded to earlier, who had so many interests when he was a kid. He was thinking about aviation. There's a great interview with George toward the end of his life when he starts making model planes. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and his interviewer has visited him, and he has, a, um, he has a room full of the things hanging from the ceiling, right? So he does have that kind of mind where he is able to, to help fashion those innovations. At first, though, there was no interest in it. Um, I love the Mott Mozart one, by the way, and I, I like to play it during my presentations because it reminds us that comedy is not timeless, right? What, was, what would have been very funny at that moment, we don't find funny at all, and it sounds like, you know, a guy yodeling with himself, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the most part, as opposed to something very humorous that in that kind of British comedic vein, many people did find funny in the moment. <laughs> And I, I for speaking with Mark Lewis, and for example, I know he has an affinity for for the sounds that were the quirky sounds that were be cre being created at Parlophone. So, it, it, you know, on the one hand, EMI certainly did have uh, a lack of studio prowess. George saw that himself when he went to Capitol Studios uh, mm -hmm. and, and watched the Sinatra session, um, you know, with his second. But other times, I do think that EMI gets a bad rap because they had something that almost no one else did. And probably the secret weapon is Ken Townsend. I mean, uh, his contribution, think of all the stories where the Beatles need to rig something up and they can call Ken Townsend in, and there he is with a soldering iron and a screwdriver, and voila, it's there. <laughs> you know, what an amazing uh, contribution he made. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. an unsung hero. He is. Definitely is. I always like to ask, uh, you know, everyone that's knowledgeable on the Beatles, what they think of George Martin's greatest contribution, because it's so widespread where the Beatles are concerned. But I always like to point out his strength in orchestration and in, and in arrangements, what he brought to songs like, you know, Yesterday, Eleanor Rigby, uh, you know, Good Night, <laughs> I Am the Walrus, Strawberry Fields, those songs. I mean, it's hard to picture those songs without them the finished versions that we've come to know and love. But what do you, Ken, think is his greatest contribution where the Beatles are concerned? I do think it's, um, it's that curation that I mentioned earlier, the notion that he was, particularly with the UK mar marketplace and creating the mono mixes, he was um, absolutely uh, painstaking, particularly given the the time constraints, when you remember a story about the making of Rubber Soul, for example, I mean, and, and trying to beat the clock, I think he, uh, his curation of the Beatles is exquisite. And it goes right to what you said a moment ago about orchestration. One of my favorite bits of orchestration is listening to the 5.1 surround sound uh, mix where you can hear the isolated orchestra for something. It is hmm. absolutely perfect. It stays in its place. But it accents George's vocal beautifully. You can go to uh, A Day in the Life, um, which I recently spent some time with, and the way George writes his orchestration to mimic the motion of John's voice, the rolling sound of I'd Love to Turn You On. And he uses that to leap into the orchestration. Of course, then we have the madcap uh, rise in sound before the middle eight. But it's just brilliant the way he plays off of them. Probably his greatest uh, strength, if I had to put it in a different kind of way, would be the way he also, though, becomes invisible. That it isn't his sound, that he's always helping them find that best version of the sound that they want. And you can hear that in John Lennon's words over and over again with various songs where he'd say, you go fix it, George. And then George would, and he'd love it. <laughs> uh, of course, he would say something later in, in life that would right. deal with volume <laughs> two um, about that. <laughs> but but in the moment, he would be thrilled. He would have, and, and McCartney too, would have George sort of play back, to use the title of one of his autobiographies, the sound in their head, or at least closely approximated. And, you know, there's this endless debate about him being the fifth Beatle. I think at times he's the third, um, <laughs> you know, when he's 
able to pull off. And I, I mean, no disrespect to any of the players in that story, but you know, he's integral to making that happen. That, that ability to become invisible and yet be visible when you're needed is a kind of genius, I think. And, and that's, that really is his best contribution. And some of these other debates that we won't solve with this book and certainly any others, frankly, about maybe what happened in the moment 50 plus years ago, I think one thing we can say for certain, and that is uh, he had a passion for, for protecting and, and revealing their sound in a certain way. But not having – it's the, the, the stamp of a George Martin recording is not having a stamp huh. in a sense. So and to me, that's his greatest strength. Whether he actually came up with some of the ideas or they were Jeff's, I will certainly engage in the debate. But you know, at the end of the day, he was fulfilling the original mission of the A&R man as opposed to the producer, right? Remember the A&R head back when he was the A&R guy in the 50s. Before there was such a term as producer, the idea was to supervise a recording. And that's what George did probably better than being a producer when that term came into vogue. He was a great supervisor of a session. And you can see that in my favorite moment uh, in the, is in that crazy session when they record A Hard Day's Night. And he's got Dick Lester sort of shouting out instructions in his ear up in the control room, right? And he's trying not to let that infect what the, the bandmates are doing down in the studio proper or even his own thinking about the song. Um, he was very good at doing that kind of level of supervision, which everybody needs. And, of course, their personnel manager, Brian Epstein, whose own life was periodically in disarray, was really incapable of that level of painstaking pinpoint supervision. So you're probably getting another long-winded answer here, but you you guys inspire me as you always have. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I mean that sincerely. And and to me that is the great joy and value of what he does. Uh-huh. Hey, I love I love hearing observations, observations of things of that things I may that. not think about, you know, unless someone else says it. And I love what you said about the song something because that's a song that you might overlook for George Martin's contribution with the orchestration there. Mm-hmm. You know, much the same way in, in recent years, I've come to, and we bring up this song a lot, Within You, Without You. I mean, think about all the work that was done between the Indian instruments and then, you know, the string section, too. It's just so brilliant how that was, you know, put together the way it was from George Martin. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it fits so seamlessly well into that album, which, of course, is an album of just a crazy array of styles and genres and 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 moments and we heard that of course recently with the the new remixes but that in itself is a contribution too well then then we have to you bring up within you without you right so Mm -hmm. here's one of the great challenges of studying george martin at any length we know through the work of of giants before us like like a mark lewis and what martin did to bring off that recording and the way it was brought off in those sessions particularly after uh, the first Harrison song was rejected, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what, a, what a magnificent piece of work. And then yet we have testimony from George in not so later years saying that, well, he included Within You, Without You at the beginning of Side 2 so people could skip it and simply place the needle, I suppose, at When I'm 64. Um, yeah. You know, to me, that, that, that boggles the mind as much as perhaps some of the Lennon remarks in the late 70s, and I, I'm always careful with those because, of course, John is a man who never gets to be 41 or 51 and rethink uh, the opinions he may have shared at certain moments in his life. Mm-hmm. Right. right. I have one final question. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, Ken, when your next book comes out, how far will it take you? To the Beatle breakup, or will you go into maybe solo projects that George Martin worked on? Well, I mean, if Officially, I'm supposed to go to the very end of the career, uh, the life, really, of George. Um, but I'm finding that it's taking a lot of telling. So one challenge I have right now is trying to to fit that second half of his experience into a single volume. As you might imagine, the Beatle years uh, in from 1966 to uh, the breakup are extraordinarily busy for him. Busy, busy for him. He's trying to start a uh, a new company. It's a, it's a startup. So he's not only recording the Beatles. Um, there are moments uh, before Strawberry Fields Forever where he has just rotating sessions of artists coming in. 
And then, of course, he has Paul McCartney, who wants to do the family way, but maybe not the work. So George ends up doing most of that. I mean, you know, that's a kind of a, a bit of a sad story. You have uh, the enormous amount of work he ends up doing for the Yellow Submarine Project, mm-hmm. when, again, their hearts simply weren't in that, uh, the making of that, uh, that feature. So George gets involved with um, Al Brodax and, uh, and those guys, the Americans, uh, working on that project. He certainly, uh, I never had the, the, the joy of meeting him, given that my, my project did not time out well with where he was in his life and his condition, but he must have been a minch. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. And it had to have been about more than the money, because he stepped up uh, like a great pinch hitter on more than, more than a, uh, thousands of occasions to help out his artists. You know, he would show up at the studio which goes back to my point about how compartmentalized he must have been. Folks like that so often are, right? So the challenge is trying to contain it in a single volume at this point. Well, I think I think we've pretty well run out of time. Um, Ken Womack, thank you very much for coming uh, on the show and talking about your book and actually revealing the news that you've got another one in the works. That's that's great <laughs> news. Uh, well, that's thank great you, news. And- and I, I want to say it, I want to say it again because I mean it so sincerely. The three of you have been uh, for years, you know, just such a key inspiration for myself, and I know many others. Uh, and the kind of questions, the insights you offered tonight um, underscore that once again. Um, my my own thinking is is even going to be more refined uh, for <laughs> volume two. Thanks to you, I mean that very sincerely. Thank um, you, thank you, know, you very, very thank much. you. We all owe a great debt to you guys uh, for really holding the standard high. Wow! Thank you, Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. When, did, when did you When did you say the, the second book was coming, Ken Womack? Um, we're aiming for uh, one year from the first. Okay. So, all right. Um, uh, and I have. Uh, I'm happy to say there'll be more unpublished photographs for the future volume. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And people can get your book at uh, Amazon, of course. Do you have any special deals about getting giving the you know through your, through a website or anything like that? I don't, but I have some nifty George Martin buttons that uh, you know I'm quite certain are the only ones being produced in the world right now that I'm <laughs> happy to give out folks to out to folks whenever I see them at various book signings. So I hope to see uh, some of you folks in the future, um, and you will get your button that you've earned. Maybe even two if you want. One for your friends. <laughs> wow. Thank, thank you, thank you. Um, let me go around the table real quick and tell. Uh, uh, have have you uh, people out there uh, find out? Oh, Ken, where can people get a get Ken Womack? Where can people get a hold of you? Um, at my website, kennethwomack.com. I've got a little contact place. I uh, like the good dean that I am at Monmouth University. I hope uh, I answer all emails. So please. Uh, let me know what you think, and any feedback is welcome. I want to be as accurate and effective as possible. Okay. Thank you again. Let me go around the table real quick and, and get everybody to give your contact uh, information really quickly. Ken Michaels, let's start with you. Uh, you can reach me by my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. As we're speaking right now, <laughs> I've had so many problems with my website. It's down at the moment. I am hoping that uh, it'll be up fairly soon because I have a special contest, which I'm shooting for uh, this coming weekend, Friday or Saturday, in which you can win the Weakling's latest CD called Studio 2, signed by all four guys in the band. And we've interviewed um, Glenn and Bob from the group here on the show and the Bayonets' new CD called Crash Boom Bang. We've talked about both CDs here. Brian Ray is in the band The Bayonets, and you can win both CDs combined if my website's working. So everybody, please keep your fingers crossed, <laughs> and uh, hopefully it'll be up uh, this coming weekend, if not fairly soon after that. All right. Hi, Alan Cozen, where can people get a hold of you? Um, probably the best way to get a hold of me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And uh, you can catch me at... Uh, my uh, page, Steve Marinucci, and I also have a Beatles news group, Beatles News and Information. And, of course, the show, you can get a hold of the show uh, on uh, the official Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. Um, and we also have a Twitter account, Things We Said Fab. You can download us on Podbean. 
and you can stream us on YouTube and the TuneIn Radio app. So we're everywhere. Once again, thanks to Ken Womack for being on the show. Um, This is Steve Marinucci for Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen saying thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. We'll be right back.